What does it mean to be rich? The answer to that question is pretty subjective, isn't it? I bet we'd all agree that Bill Gates or Elon Musk are rich and that the person panhandling on the corner is not. But just where in between those two extremes the tipping point lies is up for debate. And yet, I bet we all probably would have the same answer. Anyone, someone who's rich is someone who has more money than me. In fact, I bet if you asked Bill Gates, he'd say, I'm not rich, but now Elon Musk, now he's rich. <laughs> Whatever it might mean, we know that it applies to the man in the parable. From the very outset, we know that he is, without a doubt, rich, whatever that means. And yet, as rich as he is, it's not until this windfall crop that he experiences that he can finally feel that he can rest. That's interesting, isn't it? Wouldn't you think that if you're rich, you wouldn't have to worry about the future? But this man does. I wonder why that is. And then after his bumper crop comes in, he decides what he's going to do. Did you notice that he doesn't ask his neighbors or his staff or his peers what he ought to do with his bounty? He doesn't consult a financial advisor or a futures dealer. He doesn't talk to his banker or even to his barber. He consults himself. I know what I will do, he says. Self, here's what I'm going to do. It makes me wonder if it's because he doesn't have any peers or neighbors or anyone else whom he trusts or whose value he, whose uh, opinions he values. I wonder if that's part of what it means to be rich. I also notice that his final decision is first and foremost about himself, isn't it? He will tear down his barns and build bigger ones to hold all of his wealth so that he may finally feel at ease and rest. It all seems awfully lonely to me, this being rich. No one to talk to, no one to share with. It makes me wonder if the latter might be related to the former. Jesus prefaces this parable by warning the crowd to be on guard against all kinds of greed. I can't help but notice that the letter to the Colossians also mentions greed today. It says that greed is, not to put too fine a point on it, idolatry. So, do you understand why it says that? Can you make that leap? Okay. I see a few heads shaking. That's fine. Because I think this parable actually helps us spell it out. In that parable, there is no one like this man with whom he can consort. So he's left to talk to himself as he makes his decision. It kind of gets me thinking about how in Genesis, at the very beginning, when God is creating everything, God is speaking to God's self. Let there be light. Let there be land. Um, especially when God says, let us make humankind in our image. God says that to whom? Apparently to God's self. The man also decides that his solution is not not to build more barns, mind you, but to tear down the barns he has and build bigger ones. Seems kind of extreme, doesn't it? That's maybe a little bit of hyperbole, but I also notice that that pairing of those verbs, to tear down and to build up, that's often attributed to God in the scriptures. That's something God does. God tears down and builds up. It seems like this man is thinking of himself, or at least treating himself, as if he is God. So there's your idolatry. Greed, the selfish acquisition and hoarding of wealth, is fundamentally about trusting one's own self or one's own skill or value over God. The rich fool in the story is foolish, perhaps, because he finally thinks that it is wealth that will sustain him. He says, self... You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And yet, as the psalmist observes today, no amount of wealth can buy immortality. He trusts his goods, but not his God. And that's his folly. This story makes me wonder, is being rich a failure? Is it a failure 
to be rich. At some level, accruing wealth is always about protecting ourselves from scarcity. It's about having enough, whether that's enough resources or enough prestige or enough privilege. And that, I think, that sense of scarcity, I think that's the failure. It's not having things, it's relying on things. The failure to imagine that what we have is plenty leads to a further failure to share what we've been given out of a fear that we won't have enough, which causes us to fail to show compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, a failure to allow the peace of Christ to reign in our hearts. The man in the parable was rich, we're told. And evidently, this must refer to his material wealth and nothing else, because in everything else, relationships, generosity, a sense of peace, he's very poor. It is his wealth, and by his wealth, I mean his perception of scarcity that gives him meaning, both metaphorically and literally. We know him in the story only as the rich man. It's his defining characteristic. But what does he really own? The land that produces abundantly? The barns where he stores his wealth? The people who labor for him? The sun or the rain that nourish his crops? The stocks of grain themselves? Everything that he has exists without him. It was there before him, and it will be there when he's gone. Then it'll be someone else's turn to own them. In reality, he's destitute. He owns nothing. And it's that poverty that confounds the teacher in Ecclesiastes. When he realizes that nothing that's ours is ours, that it all belongs to God, that's when he begins to despair. And yet, he says, we spend our entire lives laboring and worrying to accumulate for ourselves things that are never really ours. It's vanity of vanities. It's the highest order of absurdity. Chasing after enough is like chasing after the wind. We may run as long and as hard and as fast as we can, but we'll never catch it. But if you stand still, the wind is all around us, enfolding and engulfing us. There is, I think, a blessing in recognizing such poverty. As St. Francis observed, it's impossible to rob someone who doesn't have anything. If you don't have anything, you don't need to worry about locks on your doors or security systems or what kind of neighborhood you live in. When we think we are rich, we create the illusion of scarcity, that there isn't enough to go around. But when we think that we are poor, suddenly we see how much God has given to share and use in common. More than enough for all. It's only the lines that we draw around yours and mine that creates that other kind of poverty, the kind where people don't have access to what's abundant. Now that's lesson in itself, but I think that these stories are about more than just material wealth. What else in our lives do we use to give ourselves meaning and worth? For the man in the story, it was wealth, but what is it for us? Family? Political affiliation? A sense of productivity? Reputation in the community? Where do we place our trust for the future? In spite of the hopeful slogan printed on our currency, we are more apt to place our trust in militaries or weapons, in politicians or laws, in economies or markets than we are in God. I wonder what that does to us. Not that long ago, I sat with a friend in crisis. They had just received some horrible news and were devastated. And as they considered their life, the question that came bubbling up to the surface again and again was, have I done enough? 
As they took stock of themselves and what they thought they might be leaving behind, their largest concern seemed to be a question of their own worthiness. It's not a question I ever heard that person voice in less uncertain times, but when the chips were down, that's the question that came to their attention again and again and again. And sadly, that story is not unique. I've heard that same question in different words, spoken in different circumstances on the lips of many people through the years. This supposedly rich man in the parable wasn't able to feel at ease until he had enough. Ample goods laid up for many years. My friend, in all of their rich blessings, blessings that at other times they readily recognize, was terrified at the prospect that facing the end of their life they hadn't done or hadn't been enough. I see it here, even in our congregation, as we worry and wonder about whether we have or will have enough, whether we're doing enough. I wonder, could it be that our mislaid trust in other things actually creates the scarcity that we fear the most? I notice that the list of things in our letter that, uh, to the Colossians of which we are encouraged to rid ourselves are either the things that we use to give our lives meaning, things like sex, or social or political causes, or retribution, or revenge, or wealth, or they are the malice, the anger, the wrath, the slander, the abusive language with which we attack or defend those things. What I hear the gospel saying to me today is that our enough is not any of these things. That it can't be any of these. It isn't our pursuit of happiness or a contribution to society or our success in any of the varied and equally meaningless pursuits with which we busy ourselves. And so the letter asks, what would happen if instead of valuing these things, instead of busying ourselves trying to accumulate them, what if we put them to death? And I don't mean eschewing them completely and living like a hermit in the desert. I just simply mean taking away their power to define us. To stop giving them the responsibility for giving our lives meaning. What if you let go of needing to be known as the rich person? Or the helpful person? Or the busy person? Or the generous person? Would you have anything left to call enough? What about our congregation? If nobody called us the tortilla church, or the toilet paper church, or the LGBTQ friendly church, or the socially active church, would we still have any reason to feel good about who we are as a community? Or would we feel that we'd failed? The letter to the Colossians reminds us that in baptism we have already died with Christ. And, in case you didn't know this, dead people can't own property. You have died, the author says, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. That's our value. That's our worth, both as individuals and as a community, especially a community centered in Christ. Christ is our value. You are worthy because of who God is, not because of who you are or what you have or what you have done. Anything we have, we have because God chooses to give it. Recognizing that poverty is both devastating and freeing. It's devastating because it rips away everything that gives our lives meaning and purpose, but it's freeing because somehow we no longer need those things. To understand this poverty is to understand that none of us is special at all. And that's what makes us special. Even our worth 
is not our own. We matter because God matters. We are loved because God chooses to love us, and we have purpose because God has a vision that God is working to see fulfilled. I really believe that only that kind of poverty can show us the truth that nothing that we value in this world matters. Ouch. That sounds really despairing, doesn't it? As the teacher says in Ecclesiastes, gener generations come and generations go, but the earth remains relatively unchanged. So who cares? All our toil and our worry, our vanity of vanities, a chasing after the wind. But our death in Christ frees us to let go of all those things that we spend our lives chasing and instead embrace this absolute poverty. Poverty that Thomas Merton recognizes as the very essence and life of God dwelling within us. He says, that little center of nothing, that spark, is God in us. And if we could see all of those sparks shining together, it would be a blinding light. Then, perhaps, we might finally see God's true abundance. We might be able to finally quit worrying about whether we have enough or do enough or can be enough and simply experience the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. So the question left to us is this. What does that look like? It probably doesn't mean selling all your stuff, giving the money to the poor, and living on the street corner. So what does it look like? What is it in your life that commands your trust and draws it away from God? What are those things that give you a sense of security, but which also cause you anxiety as you worry about losing them? What is your enough? And whether you have it yet or not, can you imagine putting that enough to death? What might living in that poverty do to you? Where might that poverty take you?